time. So in case you didn't understand, the rod has mass 2m, so they're multiples of each other. The box is mass m. It does not stick to the rod. It bounces off, and it bounces back along the path it came from at the speed of 1 quarter v. Um, what I don't have written here is let's just say that the initial speed of the box is v. That way the 1 quarter v makes sense that it bounces back at a slower speed after the collision. We'll say the rod is on some friction-free surface. So we are looking down on the rod. After the recoil, both the center mass of the rod is going to move and it's going to have an angular speed. I just want to know what the final velocity of the center of mass is first because that's something I think you should be able to do. This is a straightforward collision question. Yep. Um, there's no fixed pivot point, so the length of the rod is x. So I'm, what I'm saying is that this system is, is like at, you know, it's on some kind of friction-free like air table or something. Well, the number of people getting a start on this, not terrible, but there's a lot that didn't get a start on this. That's, that's bothersome. This is a linear momentum problem. And because there's no external force in the system, the momentum of the two objects before the collision has to be equal to the momentum of the two objects after the collision. This is not going to handle any of the rotational stuff. It's just talking about the linear motion of the system. So the momentum of the box, mv, the momentum of the bar, zero. After the collision, the box is traveling back along the same direction. I'm sorry, back along the same line, but back in the opposite direction. So m times negative one quarter v. But the rod itself now has its own velocity, but it has more inertia, so I have to put two m in for its mass times v final. We're looking for v final. This is super simple. So if you're having difficulty with this, yeah, you're going to have lots of trouble today. Now, all you had to do is figure out the final velocity. I'm noticing an m in every term right at the start. So that, that makes that pretty straightforward. Let me get rid of all the m's. They're in all the terms. I'm going to subtract. I'm going to add one quarter v to both sides. So I'll get five quarter v equals uh, two v final. So all I got to do is divide this by two and. V final equals 5 eighths V. Not particularly challenging. Any questions about that? Right. So our bar is sliding to the right. Now, you'd get the same answer if the block were started you know, where it is now or if the block struck right there. It doesn't matter where the block strikes the rod the rod's center of mass is still going to move over at that same speed. So that part has nothing to do with where the block strikes the rod. But the rotational speed depends on where the, rock strikes the uh, where the block strikes the rod. So let's look at the rotational portion of this problem. The block has angular momentum. But that angular momentum only exists relative to the pivot point of the problem. In this case, the pivot point of the problem has to be at the center of the rod because the rod does not have a fixed pivot point. It's not fastened in place. So objects will naturally rotate about their center of mass when free to do so. In this case, it's free to do so. So my expectation is that the pivot point of the system is in the middle of the rod. So I'm going to base this distance as my distance to use for our perpendicular in the course of calculating the angular momentum. So let's start with that. Um, the angular momentum of the box is going to have to equal the angular momentum of the box plus the angular momentum of the rod. That's where I'm starting. There's only one thing moving before the collision, the box. And there are two things moving after the collision, bless you, the box and the rod. 
I'm going to use the lowercase script L for the box's angular momentum because it's a point mass. And I'll use the capital L for the angular momentum for the rod because it's rotating about some axis of rotation. Now, just a reminder, this is R cross P or R M V sine of some angle or R perpendicular M V. Pick which one to do here. Well, I'm going to use the R perpendicular, right? I know that it's going to strike the rod right at the bottom edge there. So I'm going to do X over 2 for my R perpendicular. That's half the length of the rod times MV. And that is my angular momentum. Now, that's actually the angular momentum of the system, by the way, because this system conserves angular momentum. So if you're asked, what is the angular momentum of the system, this would be the answer. After the collision, the box still has angular momentum, but it's in the opposite direction. So you're supposed to be able to use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the angular momentum. And if you don't remember, the idea is that it's rotating about this point. So its rotational direction is like this. That's out of the board. But after the collision, the angular uh, direction is this way. So that's like rotating this way. That's into the board. So we're intentionally making the angular momentum after the collision negative because it's into the board. While the beginning angular momentum is positive, it's out of the board. This one's pretty obvious, the direction everything's going to spin, but it's not always so obvious. And so it's worth keeping this in mind. So when you're asked what direction does it spin afterwards, you have a method of figuring it out. Um, still, x over 2, center of mass is staying in a straight line, but this is only supposed to be the instantaneous moment after the collision. So it doesn't matter that the rod is starting to move to the right. Instantaneously, it's still the same distance. So I still use x over 2. But I will have to use m times 1 quarter v. I'm not putting a negative sign there because I handled the negative sign right there. If you didn't think to do that, hopefully you'd remember to put the negative sign in there somewhere. But remember, that negative sign is making the entire angular momentum negative. Plus, now here's where we need to be a little bit more careful. It's... I omega. This is a rod rotating about its center of mass. So I'm going to use I as 1 12th, M, which is 2M, L, which is X squared. 1 12th ML squared, but you need to do all the substitutions in there right. And all that times omega. Everybody see all that? Any questions about any of those choices? All righty. So this actually is going to work out pretty quick. When we have numbers that are kind of reasonable, we see this happen pretty fast. So I have on this side still XMV over 2 equals, let's go ahead and combine all that out, XMV over 8 plus, and this is 1 6, so MX squared omega over 6. How do I just multiply by 2 real quick? Get all the fractions out of the, you know, or at least get the 2 out of the front. You guys good with that? So, I mean, if you want, we could multiply by something else to get rid of all the fractions, but I'm just thinking about multiplying quickly by 2. That'll give me a 4 and a 3 there. And now I'm just going to start solving. I can also get rid of one of the X's. And get rid of all of the M's. We all good? So I have... 5v over 4 on this side, and x omega over 3 on that side. And we're just solving for omega. So omega is going to equal um, 15v over 4x. Now, first, 
by making the masses multiples of each other, that certainly simplifies the problem. But also, bless you, you're still reaching a point where, you, how do you know this is the right answer? Well, V is in meters per second, X is in meters. My answer comes out to be somethings per second. And in the absence of having a unit and knowing this is something that rotates, very likely this is radians. So, although no guarantee, this is a very likely answer. So, easier when the numbers are multiples, easier when we have less, uh, you know, less ambigu ambiguous kind of stuff. Um, try another one, perhaps. This one with maybe less of my interference, more of you. I want to try, um, let's try one of these. And this time, um, I think we might have you guys kind of talk about how to do the problem, maybe come to the board or something. Let's say the gravity is this way. All right? Everybody understand what I have set up there? And the ground is... Well, I don't need a ground. Let's do it this, like this. Let's say I have a dart. And let's make the bar um, eight kilograms and half a meter long. And the dart is one kilogram traveling at two meters per second. Everybody got the setup of the problem? I'd like to know the maximum angle made by the dart rod system if the dart sticks to the rod. Does everybody understand what I'm asking for in the problem? So I want the maximum angle that the dart rod system makes it to if the dart becomes embedded in the rod. Give it a try. You know, this is not a quiz. Work together, help each other out.
Based on timing and, and knowing how much time we have, uh, the mistakes that we're seeing here, some of them are, are, are catastrophic. Some of them are sim very simple. So let's talk about things that are catastrophic. You have to know where to begin on this problem. Um, if you start with the wrong thing, the, start, the wrong idea, you will be unsuccessful. I left out a middle step here. Um, there is a clear, I hope, and obvious collision that takes place. So the first thing to do is to treat the problem as if it is a collision. And that means some form of momentum rules. So I'm talking about this part from here to here. Just the instant before the dart hits the rod and the instant after the dart embeds itself in the rod, momentum is conserved between those two points. And you have to decide whether you're going to do the problem based on linear momentum or angular momentum or both. The fixed pivot point means there's an external force on the system. So this has to be conservation of angular momentum because that force doesn't cause a torque, but it does cause a force in the system. It keeps the system from just, uh, just moving to the right after the collision. So angular momentum of the dart just before it strikes the rod has to equal angular momentum of the dart rod system. Now, there are some mistakes from here, but at least starting with this helps. Once that happens, the system has kinetic energy before it swings up and stores that energy in the form of gravitational potential energy. So there is a gravitational potential energy problem after you do the collision problem. Now, the bell's going to ring here in just a minute, so we're out of time to do the whole problem. You should practice it at home knowing that this is the attack strategy. The angular speed after the collision is, I believe, 11 twelfths or 12 elevenths? 12 elevenths? 12 elevenths radians per second. 
and the maximum angle made by the rod before it swings back down is about 12 degrees. Now, that should be enough, but I still think some of you are going to have difficulty. R perpendicular MV for the dart is going to equal moment of inertia of the rod plus point mass moment of inertia of the dart times omega. That's how you find out how fast the system is rotating after the collision. And that's going to yield one-half I omega squared. You're going to use the same moment of inertia to figure out the kinetic energy. And once you have that, that's going to equal the gravitational potential energy for the center of mass of the rod and the gravitational potential energy for the dart. I would treat them separately because I think if you'll find it easier. If you don't treat them separately, then you have to find the center of mass of the system and find out how much the system's center of mass is lifted. But I found it easier to just say for the rod, um, 8 times 10, that's mg, times 0.25 times 1 minus cosine theta. I'm using the center of the rod and figuring out how much it was lifted plus 1 times 10 times 0.5 mgh times 1 minus cosine theta for the dart. The dart's at the bottom of the rod. Its value for L times 1 minus cosine theta should be from the bottom of the rod. So practice tonight, it's easier with numbers, but I didn't say it'd be easy. But it's easier, sure. The answer is 12 degrees. All right. So I believe the bell rings in like two minutes. Is that true? Yeah. All right. So we'll end right there. And, and this is an, an actual FRQ that was given to students on the AP exam. It had a, I think it was a bar of length D and mass M1. And there was located at the, uh, let me do this different. There. All right, there's another side over there. So again, there's a bar of mass M1, and it is length D, and it is already moving with an angular speed omega, and it has a fixed pivot point at the top. Um, we are looking down on this, so it is uh, horizontal. And it's on some friction-free surface. So, Located down here somewhere is a box mass M2 at rest. So the bar is going to swing down and strike the box. Now in the version of the problem that I saw in the AP exam, M2 is located directly below the pivot point. And in the course of the collision, the rod is stopped and the box continues on with velocity V. Okay, everybody understand the parameters? They asked, I think, two questions about this system. Um, the first was, find an expression for V in terms of M1, M2, and omega. And the second question was, if this system had an elastic collision, what does the ratio of the two masses have to be? So, do question A. 
find a relationship for the velocity of the box after the collision in terms of m1, m2, and omega. Next question for this, which was on the AP exam, said, if this collision is elastic, what is the ratio of m1 to m2? So I'll say it again. If this collision is elastic, what is the ratio of m1 to m2? Now, the answer to that's three, or a third, depending on how you... I said m1 to m2, so it should be m1 over m2. But you'll only get that right if you have a correct expression for the velocity here. Now, I'm not working this out. A correct expression for the velocity here should be m1d over 3m2 omega. If you've done this right, then you have the correct expression. Now do the next problem. If you didn't have this right, then you probably need to go back and do this. If the collision is elastic, that means that the kinetic energy that we have here has to be equal to the kinetic energy we have here. That's what elastic means. Right? Kinetic energy is conserved. We have an expression for the velocity. So although over here, I'm going to have one half I omega squared. Right? That's the amount of kinetic energy that we have before the collision. Any question about that? I just plugged in all the values we have. On this side, it's going to be one half m2 times the velocity squared, but I have to use this velocity, the one we get from the collision, m1 d over 3 m2 omega squared. That's it. Now work this out until you get the ratio of m1 m2. There's really not a lot to do here. You'll get most of the points just by doing this part, and the rest of the points come from recognizing that they just want you to find m1 over m2. Probably can't do that until you, you know, expand. So let's do some expanding. Uh, 1 sixth m1 d squared omega squared. Uh, 1 eighteenth uh, m1 squared d squared omega squared over um, m2. All right, one of the m2s is squared, and then the other one cancels it out. Any problem with that? I can get rid of the d squared and the d squared. I can get rid of the omega squared and the omega squared. I can get rid of one of the m1s. So this side, 1 over 18, m1 over m2. This side, 1 sixth. So 3. This one's cake. This is a good one. All the same stuff from the prior part, all the same things we've already done, but by making the problem have specific things, they can simplify the algebra. And that's what they've done. They've simplified the algebra. Still has all the same things we had to do for conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. What? So, um, how? I'm addressing your question, so let me see if I can address it more clearly. You can't count on energy being conserved in a collision unless you are expressly told that it's elastic. And even then, it's only saying the kinetic energy is conserved during the collision. There's no other way for you to assume kinetic energy is conserved unless they give you some other, perhaps, piece of information that allows you to believe that. But momentum is always conserved if there's no external force on the system. So this system had, well, this one had no external torque on the system. Therefore, momentum was conserved. So can we use momentum to solve this as well? You had to use momentum to solve it. But you can't use it to find the ratio of M1, M2. Okay. Because if we go back to where you get this answer from, which is based on momentum, then you had one half, I'm sorry, you had one third M1 d squared omega as the angular momentum before the collision. And after the collision, it was 
d m2 v. Now this will give you an expression for v, but you can't then plug that expression back in to get an expression for m1 over m2 because that's circular logic. Everything's going to cancel out and you're going to get m1 over m2 equals m1 over m2. Right? That's, that's, that's the only possible answer there. Or 1 equals 1. Right? You won't get what you're looking for because you use this to solve V. So you needed something else to give you a relationship that you could use to figure out what the ratio of M's. But they tell you what to do. Question C says, okay, assume it was an elastic collision. Now figure out the ratio of the masses. Okay. Just like this next question, which I want you to do. A new ball with the same mass as the rod is now placed a distance x from the pivot point. So pivot point here. This distance is x, this rod is m, the box is m. And in this collision, what it says is, again, assuming the collision is elastic, for what value of x will the rod stop moving after hitting the ball? So I'm not telling you whether you should use momentum or energy here. I think you should figure it out. So I'm assuming, and I think you guys can kind of see this, that in my answer, I'm allowed to have maybe M, omega, and D. That's it. I want an expression for x. What does it equal? You can do this. I trust you. I believe you. Try it. <laughs> Folks, the answer's on the board. You guys who are struggling, uh, this, one's, this one's a cakewalk. You're right, we don't know what V is. That shouldn't stop you. The whole beginning portion of this problem was to set you up to do this. Uh, you can figure out V. Right? You can figure it out. Or at least you can figure out V in terms of other variables. So, uh, one-third M D squared omega equals X M V. I'll, I'll point out that, yeah, this gives you V. Great. And again, it only gives you V because we know the rod is stopped. We already are told the rod is stopped during this collision. So I can write, you know, V as, I don't know, it's not going to be M. No, M's cancel. So D squared omega over 3X. I still haven't used the fact that this is an elastic collision. Let's use that fact now. One half, one third m d squared times omega squared equals one half m v squared. What you want here? This is pretty straightforward. It is a complete redo of the problem. Except this time M1 and M2 are the same, and we don't know what X is. We can solve for it. I'm looking at uh, an expression that has everything in it. I'm allowed to have my answer, except for, uh, well, that's it. I just got to solve this for X. Probably get rid of the one halves here. Recognize the M's going to cancel. Uh, let's do an intermediate, d squared omega squared over 3 
equals d to the fourth omega squared over uh, 9x squared. Do I have to keep doing this? Good, because I'm not going to. x is equal to the root of d over 3. I'm sorry, d over the root of 3. And I'm, I'm kind of happy that, you know, x is less than d. It means that there is a place that you can put it where this works. If I found that x was greater than d, I'd have to say there's no answer. So it's good to know that there is an answer here. But this was just doing the same thing twice. So, yeah, um, yeah. 